we look at Ezekiel 18, please again join me in prayer. Father, we boldly come before your throne of grace, which you tell us we can do. And we can do that because you are such a good and gracious God and merciful. And we come before your throne to ask for your grace and your help. Your grace and your help in understanding your word. Your word that's been breathed out by you, kept by you, preserved and brought down through the ages faithfully to us. And now we ask for your Holy Spirit's help in interpreting it rightly. And not only that, but putting it into practice in our everyday lives so that we might be more like Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. This is, uh, this is a chapter that's going to, and we won't get through it all today, but this is a chapter that is teaching that judgment is according to the individual. So if you ever wondered hey, am I paying for the the past sins of this person or that person, or will my sins affect my children? This will answer those questions for you. There's other portions of Scripture that also deal with this, but this is what you're going to find in Ezekiel 18. The reason this is put in there is very, I mean, God breathes out his word according to 2 Timothy 3, so we know that all of Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. So when something is in Scripture, it's because God wants it there. And so you might say to yourself, why is this here in Ezekiel 18? After everything we've been talking about in Ezekiel, this is an interesting choice to go this route. Well, it's because God had been, through Ezekiel and through his other prophets, telling of punishment to come to the nation Israel, to come to Judah, to come to Jerusalem. And so God had been telling that over and over and over again that your sin is going to bring judgment and punishment and wrath. And this has been said as to the nation. However, God puts this in here to make sure that people understand that the reason for that was individual sin. It's the individual sin. It's the culmination of many individual sinners bringing about national calamity, national judgment. Do you see what I mean? It's not that God was judging a nation as if a nation was an independent person, but it's God bringing about national punishment because of individual sin. The individual sinfulness had gone so far, had gotten so great, and had gone so high, or you could say the sinfulness has gotten so deep, that God is pouring out national punishment. So, God's point here is that, look, the soul, it's simple, the soul that sins will die. You can't escape that. They couldn't escape that. I can't escape that. Sin brings death. And so this is what God is doing, and he's pointing out this individual responsibility. So, let's see what this has to tell us. We start in Ezekiel 18, verse 1. This is talking about a proverb that was very familiar and uh, used frequently back in the day. And this is what it says. The word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel speaking. The word of the Lord came to me and said, What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. So, we understand that God does not like this proverb, right? Even if we don't understand what that means yet, you understand this, God doesn't like it. God doesn't like this proverb. You know this now, right? So, God is speaking to Israel regarding a proverb that is very common in Israel in Ezekiel's time. This is such a popular proverb that it's also quoted in Jeremiah 31 and in similar fashion in Lamentations 5. Comes up frequently. This is how the people of Israel responded to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and God's prophets saying, repent, repent. God's judgment is at hand. Repent. You're in trouble. Your great sinfulness is bringing you death 
And how do they respond? They don't respond by saying, yes, you're right. Let's sit down and have a reasonable, that's a reasonable argument compared to what we've known from God and how he's revealed himself to us. Yes, that sounds reasonable. Let's ponder this. Let's meditate upon what Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, let's, let's ponder about what they're saying. No, they throw out an old cliche. Boy, this happens today. Uh, the wicked, sinful hearts of man do the same things today. You warn someone of God's impending wrath, and what do they do? They throw out some cliche. Okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be. Right? Name your cliche, right? So be it. Live for today, right? Whatever. Name a cliche, throw it in there. Instead of taking the warning seriously, they throw out an overused cliche. <coughs> that happens today. And this is what is happening in the time here with Ezekiel as well. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Really what this proverb is, is a complaint. It's the idea that the present generation is being unjustly punished because of what their dads did, because of what their fathers did. Oh, woe is us because our dads were so awful. And now we have to suffer because our dads ate sour grapes. Now our teeth are set on edge because it's passed down to us. You see? Whining, complaining. That's what this is. The proverb, the proverb is saying that the fathers didn't have the sour taste, but the children did. The, pro, the, the fathers ate the grapes, but they didn't get the sour taste the kids did. It's a complaint. What we're going through now is all because of our fathers. Do you see how they're passing the buck, so to speak? This is all happening to us not because of our sinfulness, but because of the sinfulness of our fathers. That's the idea. Cause and effect. Uh, a lack of responsibility. This is bringing irresponsibility. A sort of fatalism. The fault isn't laid at my feet. The fault is laid at somebody else's feet. A previous generation has caused this, not me. And if you start to go down that road and believe that, you will never come to a place of accountability and repentance because you have to believe you've done wrong to repent. And if you don't come to a place of believing that you're in the wrong, you will not humble yourself, submit to Christ, submit to God, and repent, changing your thoughts, changing your ways. Why would you if you don't think you've done anything wrong? Instead, what this is really doing is accusing God of injustice. Hey, it was our forefathers who ate those grapes. But you, God, you've made us have to deal with the sour, bitter aftertaste. That's an accusation. That's an accusation. You know what? Let me put this in today's context, too. Uh, here I am, I find myself in a very undesirable place. I'm hurting for all kinds of different things. I'm in a bad situation, times five or six. I can point in every different direction of my life and stuff's going wrong and things are bad. And, and you know what? It stinks because none of it's my fault. I've had nothing to do with any of this. Here I am just minding my own business, being great, and all these things have fallen upon me because of the acts of others. I find my pl myself in this detestable place because of the acts of others. You know what that person is doing? They are accusing God of being unjust, unfair. All these things have come upon me and it's not my fault, God. It's their fault. And because you have not divvied things out the way they should be, ultimately, God, it's your fault. Very rarely will people actually be honest enough to say, I blame you, God. People do. People will say, I'm mad at God. I blame God. God is, is at fault for this. It's God's fault. People do actually say those words out loud. 
or say them in the depths of their own hearts. People do do that. However, it's rare. Most of the time, what people do is blame everybody else but themselves. But what they're really doing is blaming God. These people that we're reading about here in Ezekiel are no different. They are accusing God of injustice. This proverb has been used so much, and this way of thinking has been used so much, that people believe it. People think it's true. Can you understand why God hates this proverb? He's saying, this proverb will no longer be used in the land of Israel. God's telling you, I don't like this proverb. And it's clear to understand why. People trying to escape their responsibility for sin and protest against any form of punishment, any form of correction. The idea was that God is unfair. He didn't punish the fathers like he should have, and instead he's punishing the present generation. It's weird because in in some kind of twisted way, it's as if they're thinking that by accusing God this way, they will set themselves free somehow. But really, they're just digging themselves a deeper hole. Each generation is responsible for breaking the covenant of God. Each individual is responsible for breaking the covenant with God. God says, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. He does not like it. He will not accept it. Just because it's popular, God doesn't say, well, you guys like it so much, right? A good mother or a good father sees a child playing with a rattlesnake and, you know, hey, that's dangerous. But he loves it so much, I probably shouldn't take it away from it. You would say, are you crazy? Take the rattlesnake away from the child because it's dangerous. That's how God views this this proverb. It's dangerous. Just because they love it doesn't mean he's going to let them keep it. Because like a good father, he cares and he's going to do away with this damning thought, this damning proverbs. He wants to expose this false proverb, this false message, this false idea for his glory and for the good of those who hear it. Just because something is popular does not mean it is true. You can double underline that when it comes to teachings from pulpits. I'd be weary if the world is, is, finds a message from a pulpit uh, palatable and likes it and popularizes it. If something like that is approved by the world, you better take a second look. Because the world is at enmity with God, so the world shouldn't find godly things popular. God is rejecting their shifting of blame, trying to get away from, right? Who's responsible for this sin? Not me. Matrix, right? Avoid the bullets. It's not me. It's everybody else but me. That is not the way to salvation. The way to salvation is humility. God saves the ungodly. You've got to realize that you are far from God, that you are not godly, that you are not holy, that you cannot keep his commandments. This is the opposite of that. This is making excuses. Well, the reason I couldn't keep the first commandment is because of this. The reason I couldn't keep the second commandment is because of that. And don't even get me started on the rest. That's just avoidance. Instead of what does God want? He wants, like the tax collector, I can't even lift my eyes towards you, Lord, because I know how sinful of a man I am. The Pharisee, oh, so great. God, thank you for making me so awesome and so great. I'm so glad I'm not like this publican or this tax collector over here. The tax collector instead, he can't even lift his eyes up because he's so ashamed of his sin, so aware of his sin and his ungodliness that all he can utter is, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what God wants. That's what God wants. He doesn't want the evasion. He doesn't want the, the rejection of blame. He doesn't want any of that. He wants the acceptance. It's just like a parent, right? You go to your child, you say, just tell me the truth. 
Just tell me the truth. It's going to go a lot easier on you if you just tell me the truth, right? And the kids are just like, oh, well, see, uh, the Goodyear blimp came down and took my book bag and... And they come up with some extravagant story blaming everyone but themselves, right? And you're just like, what are you doing? Just tell me the truth. I already know the truth. Just admit the truth, right? That's it. God is very similar. He wants you to admit the truth. Verse 4 in Ezekiel 18. Here's the answer to this proverb, this false proverb. This is God speaking. Behold, All souls are mine. All souls are mine. Your soul is not yours. It is God's. I think that this generation needs to hear that message more than most. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. And the soul who sins shall die. This is an important point that God makes at the very beginning. You're talking about, this proverb's talking about fathers, this this proverb's talking about sons. All are mine. All fall underneath the same responsibility in God's eyes. All souls belong to God. Fathers and children alike. If this generation is complaining that their fathers escaped the consequences of their sin, God is saying, no, 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 I have authority over all. Fathers and sons, they won't escape the consequences of their sin, and neither will you. This is what God is saying. That God is Lord over all life. He is the source and creator of all, and he is the sustainer of all, and he is the judge of all. God holds everyone accountable for their sin. Not just the current generation, but the previous generation, and the generation before that, and then the generation before that. Everyone will face physical death. And some who face physical death will face eternal death. But all will face consequences for their sin, be it physical death or be it physical and eternal death. God says the soul that sins shall die. God has authority over every soul. He's the only one who can say that. He's the only one who can make such a rule in a declaration. He's not reacting. He's declaring. And God's the only one who has the right to do that. He is saying that I have judged, that I will pronounce judgment over every guilty soul. Every one. So there's no, father, son, it doesn't matter. He will pronounce judgment over every guilty soul. And everyone who should be punished for their sins will not escape that judgment. Except for a very select group. Those who will put their faith in God for the forgiveness of their sins and whose sins will be put upon his son, Jesus Christ. But yet, all sin will be punished. All sin will be punished. All sin will be punished either on the sinner or on Jesus Christ. But all sin will be punished. Sometimes it looks like the wicked are prospering in this life and that the righteous are the ones who are suffering. This is relieving in that sense. Hey, the evil aren't getting away with anything. You will reap what you sow. God is not mocked. And so the evil who act evilly and do evil things in the eyes of God are not getting away with anything. They are heaping up for themselves judgment, as Romans tells us. They're not getting away with a darn thing. They are heaping up for themselves judgment. Pity them. Don't be envious of them. Pity them. For the righteous, this is the worst it gets. 
for the righteous who are made righteous by faith in Christ and what he has done. You're giving Christ, you're given Christ's righteousness. That's why we call ourselves the righteous. Not because we ourselves are righteous, but because we ourselves have been given Christ's righteousness. So that's why we aren't glorified. We aren't boasting in ourselves. We're boasting in Christ. That we've been given Christ's righteousness. That's why we're able to call ourselves the righteous and why the scriptures refer to us that way. Because our righteousness has been given to us by Christ and it's Christ's righteousness that covers us. It's not our own righteousness. But for those righteous, this is the worst it gets. This is the worst it gets. It's only going to get better from here. The worst it gets is here and now. You're not living your best life now. That's a worldly lie from the pits of hell. Your best life comes on the other side of the spiritual river Jordan. That's where your best life comes. And that best life is for all eternity. You ever think about that? That You know what? As hard as things are, this is the worst it's ever going to be. Like... It's going to be awesome in heaven. Perfect joy, perfect service, perfect worship, perfect, perfect responsibilities. God's got the perfect things lined up for you to do for all eternity. You're not just going to be floating on a cloud, playing a harp, or humming, or anything like that. No, 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 no. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, no mind, no heart has even fathomed what God has awaiting us. So look forward to that. And don't envy the wicked who look like they're winning here and now on this earth where everything that they're doing will melt in a holy fire. So God is clarifying the idea of sinful guilt here. He's going to clarify it by comparing a righteous father who has an unrighteous son. And he's going to be comparing an unrighteous father who has a righteous son. Get it? Contrast. Bad dad, good son. Good dad, bad son. God's going to clarify this proverb and blow it apart using those arguments. So we go to Ezekiel 18, verse 5. This is how God is doing it and breaking it down into these two different paths. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, he does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity. If he does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge. If he commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, and covers the naked with a garment. If he does not lend an interest or take any profit. If he does not withhold his hand from injustice, and he executes true justice between man and man. If he walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully, he is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. So let me just break this down. We're going to, have to take this bit by bit. In the previous section, God promised that if a soul sins, it shall die. Right? Yet, God gives the contrast here. But, if a man is just, if a man is righteous in my eyes, I will not condemn his soul to death. And now, what we just read is God through Ezekiel describing the type of man that's like. Like, what's the nature of such a man? A man who is just and righteous in the eyes of God. What's he like? And that's what Ezekiel is telling us here. If, when it says he has not eaten on the mountains, it means he hasn't eaten ritual meals to idols. If you remember back uh, several chapters ago in Ezekiel, we talked about how the pagans and, the, and those who were idolaters were sacrificing to pagan idols on hilltops and mountaintops. That's what this is referring to. He hasn't done that. A faithful man, a righteous man, won't do that. He won't lift his eyes up to idols. He won't give them honor. He won't give them the time of day. He won't defile his neighbor's wife. Do I have to spell that one out for you? That's... A good guy won't do that in the eyes of God. He won't approach a woman when she's impure. He won't oppress anyone. He won't rob anyone or be violent towards anyone. Instead, he gives his bread to the hungry. These are just the qualities or the characteristics of someone who is righteous in God's eyes. Again, you can't be righteous outside of God. It's God who makes you righteous by giving you his righteousness. This is why these evidences must and are always exhibited in the life of a genuine believer. 
You can't be a genuine believer and not show fruit. It's like Jesus says in Matthew 7, a good tree cannot help but good, bear good fruit, and a bad tree cannot help itself. It will bear bad fruit. He won't exact usury. He won't charge for the borrowing of his money, in other words. And he executes good or true judgment between men. This is the idea. He walks in my statutes. He keeps my judgments faithfully. This is all the general description of a man or woman who is faithful to God. That's what that is. That's what it is. And it's in contrast to those who are sinful and who will die. Those who are sinful will die. Those who are faithful will be saved by their faith in God. And they will live. And this is what they look like. This is what they do. This is how they act. That's what this is saying. The just shall surely live. So those who are like this person show that they have genuine faith by the actions of their lives. Their faith is proven genuine. And they won't suffer. God says that the just shall surely live. Now, the just will die physically, just like the unjust. Ah, but they will live eternally. That's the difference. That's the difference. Listen to Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Moses, in Exodus 20 here, is making it clear that the children are not punished for the sins of their parents individually, but children can feel the impact of their parents' sinful lives, right? If the parents' sinful lives cause them to go out and steal and steal and steal and plunder, 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 and then those parents are sent off to jail, the children then go where? They go into protective services and the government takes them. That sinfulness of the parents has had an effect on their children. However, the sinfulness of those parents is not counted as sin in God's eyes for those children. In other words, those children don't pay a sin price for what their parents have done. But they might pay a physical price in this world for the sins of their parents. Does that make sense? That their sins of the parents are not counted on the children. God doesn't sit there at the great white throne judgment and say, well, let's see, we're, we just got done going through your life, now let's check out your dad. And a big book comes on, you're like, oh boy. Right? I did okay, but dad was awful. You're not held responsible in God's eyes, spiritually speaking, for the sins of your parents or for the sins of others. However, as a child, you might pay some price for the sinful acts of your parents. That just makes sense. So God doesn't punish children for the sins of their parents in a sinful sense. But the impact of the sinful decisions that parents have made can bring about natural consequences for the children. You also find that if you have a bunch of children who are in a sin-filled environment, those children in that sin-filled environment are watching and learning what their sinful parents are doing. That's going to increase the likelihood that those children will also practice idolatry, theft, sexual immorality, all of it. Because that's what's being modeled for them. So you can have a, a disobedient parent have ramifications that ripple down through their family but it won't count against the child as their sin. Verse 10 in Ezekiel 18. If he fathers a son, so we just got done talking about this righteous man, right? As, and he's counted righteous, not because he himself is so great, but because he has faith in God and he's given God's righteousness and that, that faith in God is shown to be genuine by the way this guy acts, by his works, 
So he's not saved by his works, and he's not made righteous by his works, but he is saved, and he is shown to be righteous by God's righteousness through the evidence of his works. That's, that's why James and Paul talk so much about works. Like, look, if you have faith but no works, your faith is useless because it's the works that prove your faith is genuine. That's the point. So don't let anybody tell you that, oh yeah, I've got faith up the wazoo. You should see my faith collection at home. I just don't ever show it to anybody. And then you say, yeah, but in your everyday life I see, you do no works that prove your faith is genuine. See? There's no faking being a Christian and a follower of Christ. It's ridiculous to think you could do such a thing. Yet every Sunday, church after church and pew after pew and chair after chair is filled with pretenders, hypocrites, people who don't love Christ. They're just there for the benefits. Or they're there to quiet their conscience. So here in verse 10, if he fathers, this righteous man, if he fathers a son who is not like him, he is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things. So his son is doing these things, but the father is not doing any of this. Who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts his eyes to idols, commits abomination, lends at interest, and takes profit. Shall he then live? So you see, this is the examples God, God is giving. You have a righteous father who does all these righteous things, showing that his faith is genuine. But he has a son who is the exact opposite of him. He does all these unholy things. Will he live? God says, he shall not live. He's not just talking about physical death. Because thanks to sin in the world, everybody's going to go through physical death. He's talking about eternal consequences, spiritual consequences. Shall this guy live? No, his son will not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. And here's the important part. His blood shall be upon himself blood will be upon himself so can such a sinful son point to his dad and say hey look at how good my dad is i get in right because my dad is so good god says no that's not how it works you are responsible for your own blood it is upon yourself you shall die so if a righteous man begets a son who is wicked, that son bears his own sin guilt. Make sense? This is, this is really, uh, really basic. But it needs to be clarified. I'm glad that God's word does it so that there's no misunderstanding in your hearts and minds. So Ezekiel describes this wicked son in the exact opposite way he described his righteous father. But even though the son has a righteous father, that does not save him. A righteous parent won't save an unrighteous child from their sin guilt. Now, a righteous parent might set forth a good example for that child to follow. Might share the good news. Might teach the scriptures and read the scriptures and everything else. But that parent can't make that child be saved. It's outside of your power. All you can do is what you're responsible for and be faithful to the Lord. And that's all you can do. And then the rest you put into the Lord's hands because he's the one who saves, like Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3 about regeneration. It's the work of the Lord. You didn't have anything to do with your first birth. You don't have anything to do with your second birth. It's all in God's hands. So what do you do? Well, you be faithful. You be faithful. You pray for that son. You pray for that daughter. But you recognize that they ain't getting into heaven because of your righteousness. That they have to come on their own. Shall this person live? They shall not live. You have to answer for your own sin. It's not good enough that your faith won't cover your children. And children, your parents' faith won't cover your sin. His blood shall be upon him. That's his blood. Your own blood is on your own hands. 
Don't sit there and blame somebody else like that proverb. Well, I mean, dad ate sour grapes. He didn't get punished. I got the sour taste in my mouth. That whole thing about neglecting responsibility for your own sins. Didn't God just blow that up right there with what we just said? You might have a righteous father and you might be wicked, but your righteous father will not spare you from the guilt of your own sin and you are responsible for your own sins. That's what God's blowing this parable up. You're responsible for your own sins. How dare you try and blame somebody else? Verse 14. Now here's the opposite. A righteous son and a wicked father. God, God is making his argument airtight. Verse 14. Now, suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. So this is the exact opposite of what we just got done reading. This time it's a righteous son who sees the wickedness of his father. He gives some examples. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor does he defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone. He exacts no pledge, commits no robbery, but gives bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment. He withholds his hand from iniquity and takes no interest or profit. He obeys my rules and walks in my statutes. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live. Do you see? This, the same rules apply. If you're wicked, you will die in your sin. And you're responsible for your own sin. And if you're righteous, God will save you. Because in faith, you are looking to God. And in doing so, God grants you righteousness. It's not of your own making, it's a gift. As for his father, because he practiced exhortation, ro uh, exhortion, robbed his brother and did what was not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his sin, for his iniquity. This is the same point, just made in the opposite way. Just in case somebody was going to try and make the argument, well, that's what you said about a righteous father and an unrighteous son. What if it's a righteous son and an unrighteous father? God gives the same exact rules. <coughs> he is no more affected by his father's crimes than his father was benefited by his grandfather's righteousness or his son's righteousness. Do you see? Personal responsibility. So Ezekiel describes this righteous son in the same way that he described the righteous father in the previous example. The conduct is listed here as identifying whether one is righteous or one is wicked. Your conduct will identify you as either righteous or wicked. Your conduct will, will mark you. And that is true in every case. In every person, in every place, in every country, in every state, in every city. Conduct will mark you as either unrighteous or wicked. God reminds us that this son who is righteous will not die for the sins of his father. In other words, if the son is righteous, he won't suffer for the sins of a wicked father. As for the father, if he's wicked, he will suffer because of sin. He will suffer because of his own sin and will pay the price. He will have eaten the sour grapes and don't you worry, his teeth will be set on edge too. There's no, there's no escape. You can't sin without repercussions. That whole proverb like, oh, the fathers ate sour grapes, but we children are the ones who had our teeth set on edge. You can't eat sour grapes without eventually having your teeth set on edge. You can't sin without eventually paying the price for that sin. Again, all sin will and must be punished by a holy God. That is the beauty of Jesus Christ and Christianity because, look, you cannot escape this fact. Those who sin shall surely die. All sin must and will be punished. So if all sin must and will be punished by a holy God, there is only two ways 
to do it. Either you yourself will be punished for your own sins or you throw yourself at Jesus Christ and say, save me a sinner. Have mercy on me a sinner. And Christ saves you and takes your sins and pays that punishment on the cross for you. But all sin is paid for by blood and sacrifice and death. For the Christian, it's paid for us by Jesus Christ. That's why he is glorified. That's why he gets all the praise, honor, and glory. And we get none. Because we didn't do anything except express our faith in him and what he has done. Verse 19. There's a little bit more of an explanation here. Why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? God's answering kind of the protest. Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. This is God just setting the principle here. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Now, this is a clean, clear principle, airtight, easy to understand. There's no legalese here. There's no fine print here. Father or son, whether if they're righteous, they shall live. Father or son, doesn't matter if they're wicked, they shall die. So God is looking at this and just making this clear to the people that Ezekiel is speaking to. God repeats this principle. He look, I look at, at everybody as individuals is what God is saying. Now the sinfulness of many individuals might grow so great that I now judge you as a nation. But when you stand before me as individuals, I look at you as individuals. I don't count your father's faith towards you and I don't count your son's wickedness towards you or vice versa. You are looked at as an individual. As God judges each man and woman individually, the righteous will be justified by faith and the wicked shall be judged for their sin and die. And this isn't just a one-time death. This is an eternal death in the lake of fire where the fire is never quenched, where the worm does not die. This is not extermination. This is punishment for all eternity. It is the exact opposite of what God promises those who put their faith in him. Rest and peace and joy for all eternity. The exact opposite is what's promised for those who rebel and who are wicked against God. An eternity of punishment. You will not be justified or condemned by your family or your nation. You go around the world and you talk to different people and you say, what do you think of America? And they go, oh, America is full of Christians. I beg to differ. I beg to differ because I look every single day and I compare what I see and hear around me to what God's words say. And I, I would be shocked if we had more than 5% of the population be genuine biblical Christians. You look at what 12 men who believed, who, were, who believed and were genuine in their faith, they were spirit-filled because they were genuinely saved. And they turn the world upside down. You try and tell me that we've got 75 million Christians in America. No. No, we don't. We have millions upon millions of people in America who are going to hear those dreadful words by Jesus Christ uttered in Matthew 7. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So God judges each man and woman individually. He doesn't care what nation you're from. He doesn't care what family you're from. That does not affect his judgment or his passing of mercy and grace. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son, or vice versa. The righteousness of the righteous counts only for themselves, and the wickedness of the wicked shall only count for themselves. Have you ever been walking in a store and perhaps you see a situation, a person, or maybe you overhear a situation, and is your heart ever moved and you say, oh, if I could just take that pain for that person, if I could just, 
If I could just almost be, if I could just be, I would almost be willing to give my salvation for that person so that they might be saved. Or if I could just spare them this or that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You, you are not righteous enough. You are not good enough to give your salvation to somebody else. Because it's Christ's salvation. So that's all you can do is pray that person into the arms of Christ. You can't, you're not righteous enough to say, God, God, hey, by the way, I'm doing so good here, but I would like to take all my accomplishments and give them over to this person. Don't hurt them that way, <laughs> right? You're, you're not that good. Christ is. Christ is. Oh, I used to think I was so uh, empathetic because I would think that way. And then one day I had the realization that, wait a minute, I can't do any of that because the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon themselves and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon themselves. I can't take anybody's place. Only Christ can do that. Only God can do that. I have to tell them, if I really care about them, if I'm really moved in my heart and my spirit and my mind about this person, then the best thing I can do for them is tell them of Christ, the one person who can take what they've got, who can save them, who can do the great exchange. I can't, but I can tell them of the one who can. It's in the New Testament that we have clearly passed down and taught to us that the guilt of Adam is passed on to the entire human race and the righteousness of Christ is passed on to all who believe in him. These are the heads of humanity, one representing humanity's wickedness and the other representing humanity's righteousness. It's because of Adam's sin that the human race inherits, inherits its sinful disposition. It's called original sin, sometimes referred to as inherited sin. And it's called that because it goes and traces its origin all the way back to Adam. After Adam and Eve sinned, our sin nature, our, our, our disposition as their children was to inherit that as well. We weren't held responsible for their sins as individuals, but we inherited their sinful disposition. And this goes back to what we were saying before. A child isn't held responsible for the sins of their parents, but the sins of their parents might affect the disposition of the children as they're being raised by sinful parents. See what I'm saying? Original sin is describing our original or our sinful condition. And it's out of that condition that sin occurs. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Okay? Let me say that again because this is a very important doctrinal truth. We are not, we don't sin, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Get it? You sin and I sin because we're sinners. We don't become sinners when we sin. We're already sinners, which is why we sin. Romans 5, 12. I'm going to skip a little here just for time. This is Romans 5, uh, verse 12, verse 17, and verse 19. It says this. So then, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all people because all sinned. For if by the transgression of one man, death reigned through the one. That's talking about Adam. Now notice, we're transitioning to Christ. For if by the transgression of the one man, Adam, death reigned through the one, how much more so will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. And there's a giant exclamation point after that. For just as though the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. God promised Adam and Eve if they ate of the tree, that they would die. And they, they did die, but not physically in that moment. They died in the sense of separation. They were immediately separated from God. They immediately had physical death was now going to be a repercussion that they never would have experienced before. And there's also spiritual death. After Adam and Eve sinned, when God was looking for them in the garden, they hid from him. 
That's ex- they're experiencing spiritual death. They hid from him. Separation from him. Now, all of us do the same thing that our great, 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 keep going great, grandparents did. In their sinful, new sinful nature, what did they do? They ran and hid from God. Guess what we do? The same thing. We've inherited that nature. We run and hide from God too. Now, what we saw in Romans 5 there is that even though all people sin and earn death on their own, we're all guilty because of Adam's sin. Because of one man's sin, death spreads to all people because all people sin. Romans 5.17 says, For if by the transgression of one man death reigned through the one, all die because of one man named Adam. Another proof that all die because of Adam's guilt is the fact that even infants die even though they never sin willfully, not when they're born, but they carry with them that original sin. So how is it possible that all have sinned in Adam? I will give you two different primary views very quickly. One is called the federal head theory. Federal head. In this idea, Adam represented all humanity before God, in a sense that like a king represents all of his people. When Adam sinned against God, he essentially declares war with God, representing all of the human race. And because of that, even all of his offspring are included in that war. And in the same way that, hey, that's not fair. I, I, didn't, I never declared war. Well, you know, if you live in a nation that declares war against another nation, even if you are against it, you're still part of it, aren't you? We sinned and rebelled against God when Adam did, because he was our representative. Another view is called natural Theory, sometimes called realistic, but natural or realistic theory. I prefer to call it the Augustinian view because it sets it apart a little bit more and it's easier to remember. Augustine believed that humanity sinned when Adam sinned because humanity was in Adam's loins when it happened. That we were, that we were in him in a sense and came out of him in a sense. Though we all die because of Adam's sin, we sin like Adam and therefore deserve death. So even though Adam was the first one to sin, don't, don't be too upset with him because if you were in his place, you would have done the exact same thing. You would have done the exact same thing. We all rebel against God in our thoughts, our words, our actions. That's why Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why in Romans 6.23 it says, The wages of sin is death, but... The free gift of eternal life is in and through Jesus Christ. Apart from Adam's guilt, we earn death ourselves from our own sin. You wouldn't have escaped it anyway. Another thing we must consider when trying to understand Adam's sin is uh, that it's imputed to us. When we repent and follow Christ, his righteousness is imparted to us. Christ's perfect righteous life is imparted or imputed and given to us. When you repent and put your faith in Christ and yield and submit to him, that's what happens. His righteousness is imputed and given to you. And you understand that very well, don't you? And we praise God for it. But you must understand that in in, in a very similar way, Adam's sinful nature is imputed to us long before. And the only salvation from that sinful nature is the imputed righteousness of Christ that comes through faith and repentance in Christ. Our Adam fell into sin and death. He was the first man. But, and he, he led us into sin and to death. But the second man mentioned here in Romans 5 is Jesus Christ. And he's the one who leads us into righteousness and eternal life. Please pray with me. Powerful reminder, Lord, that, uh, that you are holy and we are not. That all sin brings death and punishment. But for the ones who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has done for us, you give us righteousness. 
putting our sins on Him instead of us, and saving us for all eternity. Help us to always be moved and never grow cold to that reality. And help us, Lord, be stirred inside our hearts and minds to share that gospel truth with those you've put around us, that they too might repent and be given ears that hear and eyes that see, and that you might till the ground of their hearts and minds and bring them to genuine, faithful, fruitful repentance and faith in keeping with repentance in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.